Hey everybody, welcome to uh, the next video. We're gonna be talking about our first VHDL code today. So the idea is we're gonna introduce VHDL by showing you an example project from beginning to end. Um, this way you can kind of see all the tools that are involved, how things fit together, and uh, some basics about VHDL. Now some of the stuff will be new, uh, you've never seen before, so we're just gonna be briefly talking about it, but we'll come back later and other videos and we'll cover more in, in much greater detail. So the idea though is to give you the, the full picture, sort of the overview of how things work. So for our first v, uh, VHDL code, we're gonna first off start talking about how you go about doing a design using VHDL. Um, and, and there's a process that you can go through to get the most effective design uh, possible. So one of the things that you can do is let me pull up my uh, pen here. And one of the things that you can do is you can first off start by defining what the requirements are for your design. Now this seems like a silly thing to put at the beginning for some folks. They're like, well, of course you, you have to know what you're building first, right? But there's a lot of cases in industry where, uh, at least in my experience, I've seen where people who haven't done a good job of setting up the requirements ahead of time have created some serious issues later on. Um, whenever you start any project, you need to make sure that the design that you're being requested to do is the exact design that the person um, uh, wants you to do. In other words, there can be some miscommunication. I'll give you a really good example from my experience in industry. I was working on a project one time um, where, and this was in my junior, you know, I was a junior engineer just starting out. So, so, so I was really more on the sidelines in this one. And what happened was they had a status meeting and I was invited to be there as part of the team since I had just joined the team. And we were talking and, and they were introducing and showing the current status of the project to the customer who was uh, sitting at the desk, uh, listening to the activities that are going on. And so I noticed during the process of them presenting this information that he was starting to get a little agitated. He was starting to become a little bit um, angry, if you will, uh, red in the face. Uh, you could tell something was really, really bothering him. Uh, the presenters noticed it too. They just kept kind of going and I noticed they were getting a little concerned too. And then at one point in the meeting, he slammed his hand on, on the desk and he basically said, and I'm going to clean up the language a little bit, what the hell is this? And you could have heard a pin drop in that room. I've never heard 10 seconds of silence more quiet in my life than that moment. And so what had happened was the person who was paying millions of dollars for this project to get done was looking at the people who were working for him and saying, what are you doing? We've already spent thousands of dollars to get going on this and you're already in the wrong direction. So miscommunication, not understanding what the requirements were for the design led to some real problems inside the um, uh, office that day. I have no idea what happened after that. Uh, this was something that I was a junior, like I said, engineer. I went on to work on on the project and other things like that. So, but I have no idea what ended up happening as far as a fallout. But I do know that because they didn't understand what the requirements were, because the customer and the designers were not on the same page, that created massive problems in the overall design. So this first item, define your requirements, is incredibly important. You want to make absolutely sure you understand what it is you're making and that it will meet the needs of the person you're making it for or the group you're making it for. So that's why I have that in here. That's a very, very important piece of the puzzle. The next is to define your interfaces. Now, the interfaces are the interconnections between your design and somebody else. So obviously you're creating a design that's going to work in conjunction with something else. And so when you design the interfaces, it's incredibly important to do that right up front before you even think about what's inside the design. You wanna create the interface to your design and make sure everybody understands exactly what that interface is and what it does. It could be an, a user interface uh, for a large scale design. It could be um, 
the look and feel of the product, the size. There's lo lots of interfaces to, to the user that are gonna be incredibly important. If you had a cell phone that weighed 12 pounds, it wouldn't be very useful, would it? So a requirement for the cell phone would be that you would have a, a fairly lightweight cell phone, and that needs to be designed as part of, as part of your interface discussion. Now, when we talk about interfaces in VHDL, we're really talking about uh, electrical interfaces, primarily, between the input pins and the output pins, how those are configured, what types of signals they expect to have on them. And so those signals are what you're really going to be uh, concerned primarily about, and we're going to talk more about that in a minute. The next step is to declare a design entity. Now, the entity is basically a description of the inputs and outputs. It's, it's, it doesn't describe the functionality at all. It just describes the box, if you will, and what are the input pins and what are the output pins and what are their names. And so that entity description is part of the VHDL language. So if you are describing a component in VHDL, you have to provide an entity description, which describes the inputs and outputs of that component. And that's going to be uh, an important piece of the design. Once you've done that, then you have to go through and develop a, a system level strategy. Uh, 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 how are you going to approach the design problem? What are you gonna do uh, to make this design function and work? And as your design gets more complex, you'll realize this is an incredibly difficult question to answer sometimes because uh, for more complex designs, it can affect the size of the design that you're creating, the speed with which you can execute. So this is really why you get paid the big bucks is this step here, defining that system level strategy. How are you gonna go about doing um, the design internally? How are you going to specify it, et cetera, et cetera. The next step is to declare the architecture. And this is actually should be a fairly simple step. Uh, a lot of people think that this is the big step because this is where you write the code. This is where you write the definition of how it functions. But really, if you've done a good job in the previous step where you've designed the interface, or not designed the interface, but designed the system level strategy, then this step is, is fairly trivial. Uh, in the designs that I do, I'll spend sometimes weeks on that design, internal design, depending on how complex the design is, and then maybe a couple of days on the architecture step because you're writing the code to implement the design. So the writing of the code is really not that complex. It's the design process that's complex. The next thing after you've written the design is you first off, you, you really have to test it, okay? You really have to test it to make sure the design is working the way you want it to. And there's lots of different ways to test your design. We're going to be talking about the test bench, which is a um, software simulation way of testing your design. And then there's a hardware way where you can synthesize your design onto hardware and run it as a test on sort of a development board to make sure it's working in hardware. So we'll look at those two strategies as well. So that was the test of the design strategy. Now, the next and final stage is the synthesis of the design, and that's actually the creation of the of the design in hardware. That's the final step where you, where you take your design, you map it to hardware, and then you program it with a bitstream to make it become a, a final design. Okay, so let's go through each one of those steps and see uh, how that looks. So what we're gonna do to make this happen is we're going to go through the steps using an example, a fairly simple example. Uh, the example we're going to use is a device that will use as inputs three switches, and then those three switches will drive a linear display of LEDs. In this case, the LEDs will light up the number of LEDs based on the number of active switches. So let's go through and look at an example. Let's say that we, um, hmm, let me find a, a better color to highlight this with. So let's say that we activate this switch and this switch in our design. Then the expectation is going to be that the LED over here will light up two LEDs to indicate that this is actually uh, the case. So let me do this again. Activate this switch and this switch and that will cause two LEDs to light up. That indicates two switches were pressed. 
two LEDs will light up no matter what it is you're doing, right? So you could be, for instance, doing those two switches. It doesn't matter which switches you're activating. The LED pattern will be the same, two LEDs being lit at a single time. If all three are activated, then three LEDs will light up. If only one is activated, then only one LED will light up. So this is how it functions. So it's a very simple uh, design, but it's gonna carry us through the whole process of doing a, a VHDL program. So that's the functionality of our system. Let's see what we can do with that as far as our interface design. Now, obviously our component is gonna be a box. It's gonna have inputs and outputs and we need to define those interfaces, right? So we need to define those interfaces between the component and uh, the outside world. So we have switch inputs here and then we have LED outputs uh, outputs over here. Okay, so we have the switch inputs on this side and then the LED outputs on this side. Now, I've hyper special, uh, specified the interface. This is a full interface definition. You want to make absolutely sure that you've got everything down and it may seem a little overkill, but it's incredibly important. You'll notice that I indicate that this is an active high interface. That means that a we're dealing with digital signals here. So we're dealing a high signal will indicate that it is active. A low signal will indicate that it's not active. So when we say active high, that's what we're talking about. And I've even further defined this to mean when the switch is pressed, it's high. Okay, so this is getting right down into the hardware about how this is going to work uh, as far as our interface is concerned. Notice on the output side, we have an active high LED. That means that uh, when the, oops, that's a mistake. That should be when the LED is high, the, when the output is high, the LED is on. So I'll make sure to make, make that change in the final notes, but that should be high will mean the LED is on. And then LED three is the most significant bit. So that's an important thing too. We've got to make sure that we know which bit is which one. Remember in our bar display over here, the leftmost bit was the least significant, and then the right one over here was the most significant, right? So that's an important thing for us to designate here. So we're calling LED three the most significant and LED one the least significant in this particular case. So once we've defined the interface and we know what our inputs and outputs are, we know what types of signals that we expect on those inputs and outputs, we can define the entity. And this is our first VHDL code here where we define the box or the entity in which the design is going to be contained. So the entity declaration shown here basically has some keywords, entity, and that keyword entity tells the system that we're about to define an entity. This is the name of the entity. In this case, we're calling it intro. Uh, we use the keyword is to tell us that the definition is about to begin. And then we have a port declaration. Now the port declaration is all about declaring the input and output names and data types. Okay, so you'll notice, and the direction as well. So you'll notice for switch one, for instance, this is switch one, it's an input and it's a standard logic. Now standard logic is the designator for a single bit, okay? So we used to use a type in VHDL called bit, but that type is outdated and outmoded and not used anymore, so, uh, or not often. It's, it's, it's not a very flexible type. It doesn't provide a lot of capabilities, and we'll talk more about that when we talk about data types. But bit is not used, instead we use standard logic. So standard logic is a single wire, if you will, or signal, that has a value of high or low, and that's it. So all of these are gonna be standard logic, as you can see from this. But in this particular case, switch one is declared as an input of standard logic type. And if we go down to another one, we can see like LED two is an output of standard logic type. Now there are different modes, input, output, in, out, and buffer, and we'll talk more about those later, but for now, in and out are the main ones that we're going to be playing with. Once you've done this, you end the intro de uh, declaration and you're done.
So notice there's no functionality in here. There's no def definition of how this is done. This is purely a declaration of the box with the inputs and the outputs labeled and the names given to each element of the box. The next step in our process is to do a system level strategy. Is how are we going to implement the logic inside the design? And this is really where the, um, the root of the work for the synthesis or the uh, definition and the synthesis tool used to decide how to make the hardware. So this is the big deal. But remember, writing the code is easy. Designing the code is more difficult. So this is the designing of the code phase. Now we have to decide how we're going to approach this, and I'm going to approach this simple example with a set of Boolean equations. If you have some background in digital, and you do, uh, the background in digital, you probably remember doing things like uh, Carnot maps and the like. And a Carnot map is how you determine, based on a series of inputs, how the output will look. So you could do a Carnot map for each one of the signals, LED 1, 2, and 3, and then come up with a Boolean expression that would describe what that function does. So you can, using the inputs, using the switch one, two, and three inputs, you can define what the output should be for those inputs, right? So this is that's all that's happening here. So you would, could write three equations, one for each one of the LEDs, and they can make that a function of the input switches. Now, there are other ways to do the definition in VHDL, and we're going to look at a lot of different ways for the same problem later on as far as some examples. But for now, we're just going to stick with a simple Boolean expression, and then we're going to use that Boolean expression to define how LED 1, 2, and 3 light up. So we'll jump to that phase and pretend we've done the Carnot maps and we've, we've figured out what the, most, the best logic for this would be, and now we can write the equations out. And this is what done in what's called the architecture. So the architecture has a keyword architecture. There's the name of the architecture right there. And you'll notice this key phrase right here of intro. So uh, that's important because we're basically tying the intro definition to the architecture definition. So we're basically tying those two together. And what does that mean, tying those two together? Well, basically what it means is that the box we defined as part of intro is being described by this architecture of that name. That's what that's doing. So the architecture is directly tied to the entity. So every architecture must have an entity in order to describe what the inputs and outputs are. Now that entity declaration defines the input and output pins and their names and their types. And you don't have to define them in the architecture because they've been defined as part of the entity. And in the architecture, we can just use it here uh, as a tool for us to um, do our design. So we can say, LED1, for instance, is going to be switch 1 or switch 2 or switch 3, and that's the Boolean expression for LED1, right? Because LED1 is going to be on if any switch is on. So it's either 1 or 2 or 3, any, any of those on, LED is always going to be on because that's the least significant one. I do want to draw your attention to this symbol right here, okay? That's the less than equal to symbol. That's called the assignment operator. Now the assignment operator is used instead of an equal sign in VHDL to indicate when you're assigning a value to a signal. So it's called, its full name is signal assignment. Uh, um, yeah, it's a signal assignment operator. So we're assigning a value to a signal. LED 1, 2, and 3 are signals in our design. They're part of our ports for our, for our component. And then we're taking input signals, switch one, two, and three, and we're using those to determine what the values are. So you can see there's an equation here for uh, LED two, okay? And it uses logic such as switch one and switch two, or switch one and switch three, or switch two and switch three, et cetera, et cetera. So these are just Boolean expressions describing how the thing should perform and hoping and making sure that it performs the way we want it to. Very, very simple example problem. This is called data flow. These are data flow expressions. And so the data flow expressions are defining the outputs of each individual 
uh, element there. All right, so once we've defined that, the next step is to test our design. Now, we've specified the design, but we need to test our design. So we need to see how the design works and functions and to see if it functions properly in our system. There are two ways to test a design. One is through a test bench, which is software. That's called simulation. And the idea is you would simulate your design by applying some made up signals to the inputs and looking at what the outputs do, right? So we're gonna start with some made up signals on the input and we're gonna see how the de design responds on the outputs and see if it's doing the proper thing. So that's a test bench. But then we can also do testing in hardware. Now, when I'm talking about testing in hardware, I'm not talking about just writing the design to the hardware and, and seeing if it works at the end. The process of testing in hardware is actually fairly complex and you would do it typically a piece at a time. So you wouldn't necessarily write all the software, program the device and see if it works, right? That's crazy because if it's for a big design, that would be uh, really, really difficult to do. What you would do instead is you would use a strategy where you design small pieces of your design, test it in a test bench to see if it works, and then if it is appropriate, you can move it to hardware to see how it performs in an, a synthesized part of your design, okay? So a good example is a design I've worked on in the past, which is an RGB LED. RGB LEDs have a very complex serial interface using different pulse widths to represent ones and zeros, and it's a 24-bit color, so you have to stream them all at one time, and they're a very fast stream. So one of the things that you can do is first off, all right, let's test it in the test bench, create a module or a component that will generate this bit stream, and then test it in a test bench to see if it works, then synthesize it in hardware, put it on a proto board like the one that you see here, like our basis three board, and then attach an LED to some of the port pins and see if it works. Then if it works, you verified it in a test bench, you verified it in hardware as a small piece. Now you can move to the bigger picture, which is, oh, I wanna control a whole strand of these. I wanna control hundreds of LEDs. So now you go back to the drawing board, you create an, a bigger component, you test them in a test bench to see if it's working for multiple LEDs. Then you come back and run it in hardware to see if it works in that way. So you see the process. It's not, you don't design it all at once. You design it a piece at a time and you build on it until you finally get your working design. This strategy, this, this technique for testing and building is gonna make your job easier and faster. It doesn't seem like it does it at first, but it will. It will actually make things go much faster for you in the design because you're, you're skipping these steps where you run into major problems and you don't know where things are going wrong. It's, a, it's just a very good way to approach designing complex systems. So let's talk a little bit about the test bench and, and the concept of a test bench so that you kind of have a feel for it. The test bench basically is another VHDL file. So you're gonna create another component in VHDL called test bench and that test bench is going to plop down inside of it the component that you're testing. So in this case, we're gonna have our component that we're testing, that's the uh, intro component here. So we're gonna be testing the intro component and we need to apply signals to the inputs of that intro component to see how it works, right? So we wanna test every possible input on here to see how it works and then we'll look at the output over here with our simulation tools so that we can see that the output is actually doing what it's supposed to be doing. So we start, like I said, by creating a test bench and the test bench um, basically is a component. So this, think of this as a big component called the test bench. And then inside the component, we drop our intro and then we create an other block in here called switch driver. Now the switch driver applies signals to the intro component and then looks at what the output is. In test bench terminology, we always refer to this as a UUT, okay? So your, your component that you're dropping into the, the test bench is a UUT or unit under test. That's, that's just standard nomenclature, so unit under test. And then we apply signals to the unit or test 
to see how things are, see how things are working in that design. All right. So let's look at a test bench, a part of a test bench declaration. This is not the full test bench, but this is the, the important part. This is the uh, switch driver part of it. So if we look at the switch driver part of our test bench, you'll notice we're using a few new words and that's okay. We're gonna describe these in great detail. We're using a process later, but the, we're using a process statement and the process statement defines the functionality of a block. And like before we saw this block here, the process really defines the functionality of this block, switch driver. And so this is, this is how it works. Now, the HDL has some really neat syntax in it that allows you to write code and wait for a certain amount of time. Now, this is completely unsynthesizable. You can't create this in hardware. This is purely software simulation. And we're just trying to create this waveform that we can apply to our design. So what we do is we start by applying a start signal to all of the switch inputs. And, th and this is actually pretty cool, right? Because we, we can assign a, a signal to all the inputs and then look at the outputs on a waveform uh, simulator and then see how, see how it's coming out. And we're gonna see that in a, in a bit. And so basically you take all these signals and you assign them. Now notice one of the things is I'm not assigning a specific value like one or a zero, okay? I'm assigning the word active. Now active is a constant that I've set up at the beginning of the test bench to indicate what an active signal is. And in this case, we decided the active signal was gonna be a high. And so the active will be set to a value of one. In your code though, you never hard code values like that. You always use constants because that gives you flexibility later for changing your mind or changing things. If you decide later that, oh, my active signal needs to be a, a, an active low to turn on the LED instead of a high, you change that in one place, hit their constant, and then you're done. So that's, that's the reason we go in that particular direction. Then we issue this weird statement wait for 10 nanoseconds. Now, waiting for 10 nanoseconds simply means you're telling the simulator, I want you to hold for 10 nanoseconds and then apply a new set of signals to the input so I can test those. And you continue to do this throughout the design. And so you'll notice that basically what's happening here is your code's going to continue until you've gone through all combinations of input switches, eight possible combinations for three input switches. And then you'll end with a final wait statement to terminate the process. So this basically causes the process to lock up and stop. And then that's, that's, that's what you want it to do. And we're going to explain about this waiting and how processes work and all that stuff later. But I wanted to give you a flavor right up front as to how this design is, is coming together. Okay, so now in the next um, next part of the videos, we're going to go actually take this design and we're going to put it in our system using the um, Vivado development environment for Xilinx to go on the Basis 3 board. So stay tuned for that one.